Good morning, good afternoon, and a very good evening, everybody. It's 9.30 here in the UK, and thank you all so much for taking the time uh, to listen to me this morning uh, in England time. Today's presentation, the key thing that I'm aiming to do is to generate some debate, really. What I'm, I'm not going to do is sit here and proclaim this is how it should be done, this, this is the right way. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Mark Love, Principal of Oxford Sixth Form College. I've been a teacher for a rather frightening 30 plus years. Um, and when I trained as a teacher, uh, as well as obviously gaining subject knowledge, we did look in quite a amount of detail about what motivated young people, how they learned, why they learned, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, I became involved for the first time in interviewing students for admissions to, to schools and to colleges. It was very, very interesting to listen to them in terms of their motivation for choosing a particular subject or a particular course uh, to study at the age of 16 or 17. So the focus of today, really, the right choice for the right student is about those 16 and 17 year old students who are ready to choose between A-levels, BIB, or a, a BTEC qualification. So we're going to look at how we ensure all of us, because we all play a role in this, that we do achieve the right choice for the right student. Uh, next slide, please, Lucy. Now, I think that the first stage in this journey, this road, if you like, is understanding how learning works. If we're going to make or assist the student in making the right choice for them, we have to have an understanding of, of how learning works. Now, clearly, there's been decades of research on this particular issue. And as I say, I first read material on this um, 30 years ago very sort of sociologically orientated, pulling on psychology, um, an extremely interesting uh, area of academic study. Uh, Susan Ambrose is uh, an American academic uh, at Northwestern University, and she developed the, the seven principles of how learning works, I think it was about nine or, or 10 years ago. And whilst a lot of it was not particularly new to me, I think Susan, Dr. Ambrose, crystallized many of the central elements in explaining how learning works. If we don't understand how learning works, how can we make sure that we match the right student to the right course, A-level, IB, and beta? Now, I'm not going to go through every single one of these bullet points. I want to pick out some of the central ones and just sort of share my, my thoughts on, on some of them. Now, the first point, students' prior knowledge can help or hinder learning. What do, we, what do we mean by that? Now, prior knowledge is not just about their previous academic qualifications. It's the knowledge that they've acquired through their lives. A very simple example might be we have a student who has never studied business in a school or a college beforehand, but his mother is a very successful businesswoman and he's been immersed in his mother's business for 10 years. He's acquired knowledge about business. Now, one of the things that Ambrose means by prior knowledge can help or hinder learning is that if a student has acquired academic knowledge or non-academic knowledge, how they use that, how they've been taught to use that can help their learning in the future or indeed it can hinder. So if you like, they've been, it's socialization. They've been brought up in a particular way, they've been educated in a particular way, they move to a different environment and their past experiences and their past knowledge block advancement in that new education system, if you like. Motivation. Clearly, not just students, all of us, our, our levels of motivation determine and can drive um, our success in both our personal lives and in our working lives as well. 
um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a kind of wonderful um, exposition of the different stages of, of motivation that we go through. Now, it determines what they do to learn. So those of us who are parents, um, and indeed perhaps remembering ourselves as students in the past, our level of motivation influences the extent to which we do what we need to do to learn. That motivation can be generated clearly from within, it can be generated from the family environment that one is in, and crucially, it can be determined by the, the teacher who's in the classroom um, with you as a student. Goal-directed practice. I, I think this is a very, very interesting one because in Ambrose's view, as, she's, as we've written here, goal-directed practice coupled with targeted feedback enhances quality of students' learning. Now, self-evidently, what I do as a teacher, what I write out of the time, um, on a student's piece of work, that needs to be formative assessment as well as normative assessment. In, in plain English, it's no good doing what my teachers did at school, which was A, well, more often a C actually, not an A, um, and that was it. I just did C grade on my A-level history essays. Well, what do I do to improve the next time? What did I do wrong in the essay that meant I got a C not an A. Were there any good parts in the essay? Why were they good? So that feedback that is provided to a student is absolutely critical um, to enhance the quality of their learning. So one of the ones I find very interesting is, is goal-directed practice. And it's this notion, which is perfectly sound, of if you set students a Goal, short-term goals, medium-term goals, long-term goals, then that will achieve success. I think lying within that is how different students react to goals in very, very different ways. Some students want a series of short-term goals, almost week by week. Other students, medium-term, term by term. For other students, in my experience, and this is generally boys, and there's research uh, on this, which I'll refer to very quickly in a minute. Two-year A-level, two-year B-Tech, two-year IB. Lots of boys, it's the end game. It's the end of those two years of study. That's the motivating element. And giving them lots and lots of short-term goals through that programme can sometimes be counterproductive. Now, the research that I mentioned, there's a lot of evidence, um, and I'm talking here about A-level in particular, that if we travel back in time, bear with me, my A-levels, three A-levels, two, two three-hour papers, similar to how they are now. At that time, well, let's bring it a little bit closer to the future, in the 1990s, there was a lot of research that was saying that boys were outperforming girls um, at A-levels across nearly, nearly every subject. And because they were driven by this last minute goal, um, a great expression is they would wing it, which comes from a phrase, uh, doing something on a wing in a prayer. And their level of motivation soared in that last two or three months leading up to, to the A-levels. And they worked and worked and worked. Whereas the girls were much, much better at yeah. working in a very organized way, because boys aren't organized. Sorry, guys, we're not. Uh, organized way through through the two years. So when the A levels were reformed in, in the year 2000, so I'm not talking about Michael Goh's reforms of 2015. When they were reformed in 2000, and they became modular, and the quality of coursework increased quite significantly. Girls outperform boys in A-levels for about 11 or 12 years. Now, clearly there are other factors at play there, but for me, it did illustrate how, as a teacher, I had to use those goals in very different ways. For some of my students, boys or girls, 
my giving them weekly goals was counterproductive. It irritated them. For others, it put a huge amount of pressure on them, which they couldn't cope with. They wanted more medium-term um, goals. So Ambrose's point there about goal-directed practice, I don't disagree with it. I just think it, it's far more complex than one might initially think. To develop mastery, students must acquire competent skills, practice integrating them and know when to apply them. Agreed. They need to know how to analyze, they need, need to know how to uh, demonstrate evaluation, particularly at that post-16 level, A level, IB, beta, um, as you will know, those skills of analysis and evaluation are absolutely critical to, to achieving those, those high grades. This next point is, is very, very interesting. I want to come back to it in a bit more detail later on. And it's once again, it's this notion of the environment within which a student is studying has a profound impact, impact on whether the learning, the teaching in the school or the college or the university is, is being effective. And I've worked in many, many different schools and colleges. I, I've worked in inner city schools with classes of 30, 35 students. I've worked in small colleges. I've worked in the state sector, day school, boarding school. And all very different physical environments and we have very different organisational cultures. And although I didn't have the time to make notes and, and put forward a PhD proposal, um, it did strike me how it's not just the physical environment, how the culture of a school, how the values of a school affected how good the learning was. Now, I'm not a psychologist, I teach economics and I teach business. Um, but it is potentially, until Ambrose really pulled these strands together, the, the missed element within uh, what makes learning work. You know, we, we know that students, we, we need to teach as teachers, we want a room that has got bright, it's bright, it's got light, you can communicate the physical structure is, is good, comfortable, and so forth. We know that. What's more nebulous is the, the values of the organization, the values of the college or the school, and how they are communicated and how that uh, impacts upon them. Self directed learning is the, the last point. Um, for me, at Oxford City and College, this is, and as we'll see later on in, in the presentation, this is a, a very central element for all students, but in particular for the students who are studying BTEC business, where the mode of assessment, as we'll see later on, is very, very different. Uh, and there is that need for students to be very, very self-directing, motivated, to not need a teacher to constantly be pressing them um, to undertake particular tasks. Now, clearly, A-level and IB students also need those characteristics, but the mode of assessment in BTEC means that it, it, it's even more important for, for BTEC students. So, do Google Susan Ambrose, uh, the seven principles, but we'll later on today, if you have the time. Um, as I said earlier on, I think she captured it really, really well. Uh, she, it was the context of her research was uh, an engineering faculty, faculty at the University of America. Um, but I think this, this all applies to, to younger students uh, in schools and colleges as well. So that's a short summary of, of how learning works. That students' prior knowledge helps or hinders, levels of motivation, affects things, goal-directed practice and the extent to which goals work with a student, um, and so on. So now we have um, an idea of that's the description of effective learning. What we all need to do in our roles now is say, well, okay, if we accept that that is what generates effective learning, and hopefully we can discuss some of that later on, 
how is that useful? Or how is useful is with that information in the background, one then looks at the characteristics of the student in front of you. And if you like, you're, you're trying to achieve a, a match. So let's have a look at the characteristics of the students that all of us uh, in this webinar will, will meet and, and have met. Um, so Lucy, next, next slide, please. Now, I haven't attempted to, to put in every characteristic of every student. Clearly, that's impossible. Um, and I'm not, I'm absolutely not trying to generalize all the wonderful young people that we work with are all individuals. But I think you would agree with me that, that certainly in my career, these are characteristics of students that come up before me when I meet them very, very, very frequently. So let's go, go through some of them. And some of them are self-evident, some I want to sort of provide a little bit more background to, once again, from my perspective. First of all, you know, we will have students who have that prior knowledge, as I described it earlier on, from their, from their life experiences. And I, or Max, who's Oxford Sixth Form College's Director of Admissions, um, or Chris Borthurst, if Chris is interviewing a student and his colleagues um, around the world, one of the things that they will do is get the, get the student to open up to you and talk to you about their background, their interests, uh, and what they've been doing outside of school. In that way, you're getting that insight into their prior knowledge. Academic background, we can get from a transcript from the school, but prior knowledge, becoming aware of that, can it becomes available through, through conversation uh, and with that young person. And as I say earlier on, to, to me, those are two quite distinct things. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but they, they can be seen as quite distinct things. Now, focused career, focused subjects. Why have I separated those two things out? Um, here is why. I will meet students who will say to me, Mark, I love physics. I love art. I love economics, history, name a subject. Mark, I love politics. I love economics. I love history. So they are resolutely focused on the subject that they are going to study. However, when I then say, so what would you like to do after A level, after A, B. Not sure. Which subject would you like to study at university? Not sure. So they have that tremendous focus on the stage of their education that I'm involved in, 16 to 18, 16 to 19 years of age, but thereafter, they're not sure. Focused career students. You'll have students who know absolutely which career that they want to head for. But then you say to them, which subjects would you like to study before going to university? I don't know. Which subjects do you love? I don't know. None really. So they've got a clear career idea, <coughs> excuse me, but they don't have that clear, very, very short term um, focus on, on subjects. Now, clearly, that's where we play such an important role in guiding and advising. And there is that explicit link with the title of the talk, the right choice for the right student. No focus. Now, we've all met students like this. Um, they're generally lovely, lovely young people, um, but they have got no idea. Which subjects do you like? I don't know, Mr. Love. Uh, do you like anything? Uh, no, not really. What do you want to study at university? Uh, don't know. Career? Um, I don't know. And a lot of young people are like that. Clearly, especially at the age of 15 or 16, that there is this lack of, um, it's not a criticism, it's an observation. There is this lack of, of focus in terms of where they want to go and what they want to do. Now, simplistically, that's where that conversation about their prior knowledge becomes so important because through that element of the conversation 
one can start to develop a pathway or a number of potential pathways for the, the student to follow. And that's something that um, Mags, if you're on the call, I'm not trying to embarrass you, that, that Mags, who's the Director of Admissions, does so, so brilliantly well. So she will sit with a student who at the start has no focus. And by adopting that approach, that conversation approach, by identifying prior knowledge, then she is able to create pathway options for, for the students. Clear goals. Yeah, now they, these are our perfect students, aren't they? They sit in front of us um, or at the moment, hopefully soon to end, they Zoom and Teams with us and they say, I want to study this and I want to go to university to read this subject and I'm going to do this in the future. Um, great student. But then you look at their academic background and you know, using your knowledge and your experience, that the clear goals that the student has expressed are going to be extremely difficult to achieve. Maturity motivation. I don't think one can underestimate the importance of assessing, let's focus on maturity because we talked about motivation earlier on, of assessing a young person's maturity with regard to how that will impact upon their studies or impact upon the choice of what they study. IB, A level, BTEC, as we'll see further on in the presentation, require quite different um, characteristics. Uh, and that level of maturity in terms of the ability to manage one's own learning, as I mentioned before, um, that ability to respond to a teacher's positive direction or criticism in a mature way is, is essential. You know, if you've got a young person who responds to teachers with a, a dismissive your input is, is of no value, I, I'm, I'm not going to heed that advice, then he or she is, is not going to make an academic step forward. Level of English. Um, and I include that for every student, not just international students, all students. Now, whether that's expressed in IELTS grade, a TOEFL grade, GCSE English, language qualification, um, for British kids or international kids, it doesn't matter. The, the level of English is essential in identifying a student's potential uh, for success at IB, A level, or, or BTEC. Exams plus or minus, nice easy one. Um, does the student like exams? First question. Second question do they perform well in exams? And that's when we obviously look back to the academic background inside uh, of things. Many students are brilliant at exams, but hate them. And that's where they need that um, support and guidance to ensure that they do choose the pathway that does contain exams. Even though they don't like exams, it's boosting their self-confidence and boosting their self-esteem through that conversation of I know you don't like them, but look how well you do with exams. And therefore, an exam orientated um, program of study is absolutely fine for you. Um, once again, without wishing to patronize young people, I think we should never forget they are, they're 15, 16, 17. And um, like all of us when we were that age, there's a carapace of confidence often. Um, and if one gets behind that uh, in a very encouraging kind of way, then one can see those, the lack of confidence. And it's about reassurance. It's about expressing optimism in what they can, they can achieve. Okay. So we've looked at how learning works. We've looked at the characteristics of the students that that come before us. So what should they choose? Next slide please, Lucy. The fundamental choices, and this is a very simplistic um, characterization that many of you may disagree with, um, which is of course absolutely fine. 
but I think it's reasonable. If we imagine um, a triangle, we've got breadth, IB, at the bottom. We've got depth, A levels, in the middle. We've got narrow, BTEC, at the very top. And I think that demonstrates um, the fundamental choices that are in front of us to discuss with those students and to make sure they choose the right one. So they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but let's characterize it in this way. Breadth versus depth versus narrow. Now, if we've gained that profile of our student through those characteristics, we've discussed things with them, we've got a very good profile, a very good picture of the student and his or her um, characteristics. We have an understanding of how learning works. We combine those two things to enable them to make the right choice. Next slide, please. Now, you are all tremendous education, some great experience in education, so clearly and I haven't put a huge amount of information about the structure and nature of A-levels, IB and BTEC. Um, but I think it's worth just very quickly going through those. So, so my apologies, because you, will, you probably know all of this already. So A-level students study three subjects, get three separate qualifications. That enables them to, to progress to university. Now I've written 100% external assessment. As you know, all the science A-levels, they have a practical component that the students have to complete as well. And for some subjects, um, history, for example, there can be a coursework element. But in very simplistic terms, to enable these, this comparison, that's in our minds, A-level 100% external assessment. So the papers set by the exam boards, marked by in normal years, marked by the exam boards as well. IB, um, six subjects, as you know, across high level, standard level, it's the extended essay, the creativity activity service, so CAS, um, as I do call it, and TOC, the theory of knowledge. So all of that generates one qualification, um, a significant amount of work, self-evidently, um, and beyond the, the academic. The assessment does vary according to the subjects within the IB that, that one is studying. But in broad terms, the internal assessments range from 20 to 50 percent, and then there is external assessment examinations um, that the students have to complete as well. BTEC, one subject, one qualification. Now, just for me to be very, very clear, I'm talking about the BTEC extended programs. So at Oxford Sixth Form College, it's the BTEC Business uh, Extended Program which is a two year program. So I'm not referring to, to one year programs in this presentation at, at all. Very, very narrow, obviously focused on business. Now having said that, the, the breadth of what the students study within business is tremendous, marketing, human resources and, and so on. But it can still be defined as narrow, it's business, it's one subject and one qualification. The, the BTEC, the formal exam, akin to those taken by IB students and A-level students, is 12% of the overall assessment. So clearly very, very distinct from A-level, extremely distinct from A-level, and very distinct from IB. Now, hopefully this will provoke a bit of discussion uh, later on today, and just keeping an eye on the, the time, because I don't want to, to talk for the entire hour. What do I think an A-level student looks like? What are the characteristics that she or he has? Their academic background, self-evidently, is very, very important. Um, it does not follow my subject, economics. The student need not have studied GCSE economics or economics in their home country to study that as an A-level subject. It's their broad academic background that indicates their ability to study that subject. And it's the same for a number of other A-levels that are rarely taught pre-16, so psychology, for example. Psychology, we're looking at what's their biological uh, ability, what's their mathematical ability, what's their English ability like. 
but the academic background is very, very important. Um, focused on career. A-levels, as we know, are tremendously deep in what they cover, but the most successful A-level students are those that know exactly where they are going to go with these A-levels, i.e. in terms of university and in career there, thereafter. Uh, in the 30 years, uh, no, sorry, 31, 31 years I've been teaching A-level, all of my A-level students, the most successful ones, yes, there's an academic background, what are those that have this very clear focus of this is where I am going with, with my A-levels. Ironically, this ties in with what I said before, the other students who are very successful at A-level, they don't have that career focus, but they absolutely love those subjects that they are studying. And that provides that phenomenal motivation. In essence, students should not choose A-level if they are choosing subjects where their, their approach is, well, it's better than nothing, isn't it? They've got to have that interest, a deep interest, in the three subjects that, that they study, either in the subject in and of itself or because it's a means to, to an end. So they might not particularly enjoy mathematics, for example, but they want to become a doctor, so they're studying biology, chemistry, and mathematics as an input. Clearly, a good level of English for international students, 5.5. Now, the SEI element, I'm going to come to, back, come to that at the end, so it's that, that social um, environment, and it's the sort of culture that I was talking about um, before. IB, academic background is important. Um, I don't think it's as, personally, I don't think it's as important as it is for, for A-level, but it is nonetheless still, still important. IB is a, is a great qualification because of its breadth. Um, if you have somebody who, despite your very best efforts to map those characteristics, is, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I have no focus, I have no particular subject I like, I have no particular career, and they don't want to focus on the three A-levels, then the IB is, is, is the right qualification for them. Um, I'm an A-level teacher, as I said, I've been teaching it for a long time, so A-level is very much my, my love, my best thing that I don't enjoy. But IB is actually the, the right qualification for, for many students. They do need to be self-disciplined self, self and very well organised. Um, the constant work through the program um, is significant, um, as you are, as you all know. You've got they've got to be constantly self-disciplined, self-motivated, and, and very well um, organised. BTEC um, prior knowledge is important. Academic background is extremely useful. Of course, it is. But once again, in my experience, it's that prior knowledge. It's those students who their mother or their father are entrepreneurs or very successful business people. It's that family environment background that the student has grown up in. He or she may not have performed amazingly well academically at school, but they have this unequivocal um, desire to be a successful business person, to work with their, their, um, their family business. And Max and I, it's great. We see that a lot with, with students who are interested in beta um, expressing this. I'm going to take over my mother's company in the future, or I'm going to set up set up my own business. And for students who don't have that deep academic background, but nonetheless are focused on business, it, it's a great, great course. They do need to be self-disciplined. Um, this is where there are parallels between the BTEC and the IB. So in essence, the students are producing what I would call a portfolio of work throughout the two years. So once again, they need that skill set of being extremely well organised and self-disciplined. Now let's come to the, the last part about the climate, what I'm calling the culture of, of, of the college and of the school. Across all three programmes, all three choices that lie in front of a student, where they study, the values of the school or college, where they study, whether it is IB, beta, or A level, is, is absolutely crucial to their success. Um, many students thrive 
in a smaller college such as, such as ours with 200, 250 students, um, other students thrive in, in huge schools. That's what suits them best. Some students thrive in a culture such as a sixth form college where we treat them like young adults. We don't treat them like children. And they really respond to that mutual respect and to not being treated, treated like children. Other young people need to be in school. They, they need that, you know, once again, without wishing to patronise them, that, that being, to continue being treated like a child, that's, that's what they need because of their levels of maturity. And, and that's appropriate to them. So I think when we are trying to ensure that the right choice is made by and for the right student, we have to understand how effective learning works. We have to understand the key characteristics of a student in depth. And then we can use that to guide us into A level, IB, or, or BTEC for that student. And by adopting that approach, in my opinion, we ensure the greatest chance of, of success uh, for the young people for whom we, we are responsible for them in the short term and indeed for their entire lives because the success or otherwise of what we do with them, the advice, the guidance and then the teaching does have a profound impact um, across, their, across their entire lives and I often say to my staff um, that, that we should never ever, ever forget that. That's why we are educators. Thank you very much for listening everybody and uh, our next slide will hopefully say questions. It does indeed. So please do feel free to um, put any questions through to, to Lucy, who I think is, or Charlotte, who is hosting the meeting at the moment. Uh, so we've had a couple of questions so far. Um, the first one is, when would you advise when I should recommend A-levels, IB or BTEC instead of the international first year? So I you instead of? The international first year. I think it's on its maturity of, of the student. I think it's about the culture of the school or the college um, or the university type campus that, that's where that course is being delivered. The, to me, those are the key, key elements. Um, we, we're not talking about one year programmes today, but let's touch on that briefly because it is relevant. So we run the BNC UK IFY International Foundation Network. And lots of our students who are studying that program are doing so successfully because they want to study the course within a small college environment rather than doing so on, on a big, a big campus environment. So it's the culture of the place and the size of the place matching that with the maturity of the student. Um, and this is a question I quite like actually. What do you do if a child and their parents' opinion differ in terms of the educational path that they wish to take? I, I smile. Uh, I think I think everybody is probably smiling on the call now. We'd say many times we've had that, haven't we? Um, you know, the student wants to go this way, uh, and the parents want them to go that way. Um, and I've certainly had that many, many, many times. Um, I use one example from from my experience, and then come back to. Um, I, I had a wonderful girl at one of my previous colleges, uh, she was from South Korea. Um, and she called herself Sam. And Sam was amazingly artistic, uh, just fashion, design. She, she, she loved it. She absolutely loved it. Her father was a very successful businessman and wanted her to take over um, his, his business and career. So dad was very much, Sam will study business, Sam will study business. Sam was, I want to study fashion, I want to study something creative. Um, what I did was, through speaking with both of them separately and, and together, was talk to her father about the marketing side of, of his, his business, a very big business, and the creative side of, of, of marketing. 
and then spoke with Sam about the creative side of marketing. I then spoke with the father about um, Central St. Martins and the foundation year and Central St. Martins being, as we know, the, the Oxfordshire of the art world. And so I managed to get her father to agree that Sam could go to Central St. Martins, apply to, and she got him to Central St. Martins for the foundation year and, and prove herself. And if she proved herself, she could carry on uh, with the art because it would ultimately have use within marketing. Uh, Dad accepted that, Sam was delighted. Um, she graduated from Central St. Martins a few, seven or eight years ago now, and is working for her father's firm. So it, it, it takes a lot of time, as you all know, parents this way, student that way. It does take a lot of time to try and identify some commonality across the two. Now, stepping away from Sam, and I think this is probably the, the fundamental part of the question here is, what if you can't find commonality in that? What if they are diametrically opposed and never the twain shall meet? That is when you go back to that characteristic slide. Once again, it's going to take time. And you are highlighting the particular characteristics of the student. And you use that and your knowledge to demonstrate either to the student why the parents are right, or to demonstrate to the parents why the student is right. Now, as we all know, that, that that's quite a brave thing to do sometimes, to say to it, some parents, no, that's not the right way to go. But I think we have to do it. I think, you know, I, I've often interviewed students, international and British students who profess you know, they want to be a doctor. Um, and the academic background simply is not there. It is not there. And, and I spell it out and will say to the parents, look, this is not, this is not going to happen. You stay with medicine briefly. You can present them with other pathways that might lead there. So look, your academic background is weak. You, there's no way that you're going to get A-level grades to get into medical school or the right unit school or UK school. But you might get good enough A-level grades to go on to biomedical science from where you could go for graduate entry medicine. So once again, it's about sharing alternative ways. Um, but uh, to the question, uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's that's a time consuming situation when the parents and the students are diametrically opposed, but it takes time. But if you can't find common ground, I think it's best to be absolutely honest with parent or student and, and explain why using the characteristics in my slide, if you like, of why either party, so to speak, is wrong. Um, and another question we've had here is, how important for you is it to have UK students studying alongside international students on A-level and BTEC programmes? Uh, I think there are, there are many multi-layered answers to that. The simple answer is absolutely crucial because, <coughs> excuse me, and it's the, it's the wider purpose of schools and colleges. I think it's wonderful for all those young people, the Brits and the international kids, to be together in the classroom. The value of that to them as individuals, to their families, to their countries, to their parents, to their futures is absolutely immense, absolutely immense. Um, and I think the, the world in which we live the world that we're going to live in, in the future, I think breaking down those barriers, um, whether they be cultural or, or national uh, or social, is, is, is it such an important part of what we do. So having the Brits in, in the class with the international students is wonderful for all, all of the students. So it's a very long answer, but I think it, it's something that I'm very, very passionate about and I, and I always have been um, in education. That's one of the we're there, there, obviously, to get them their A-level results, IB results, and BTEC results. Of course we are. Um, but we should never lose sight of all those other tremendous things that, that we should strive to achieve uh, for the students. Um, 
at all the questions that's been submitted um, so far. We've had a few asking if we're going to be circulating the presentation. Uh, yes, we will be. So we'll circulate the presentation as well as the recording of the session as well. Um, if you do have any other questions, feel free to add them to the chat or raise your hand and we can allow you to speak. What I would be very interested in, Lucy, in, 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 if somebody wants to contribute, would be you know, it, it's great. This is why it's great to do these things. You know, this, this is like being a teacher in a event. Um, if something, anybody fundamentally disagrees with some of the points I've made, it would be super to hear that. Super to hear that. Um, yeah, I, I do not pretend for one minute, as I said at the beginning, to have all of the answers. A lot of this is very much. Uh, you know, based on my experience, but if others have different experiences, it's always really, really helpful to, to learn from that through through discussion. Uh, another question just come through: What is better for medicine preparation, the A level or IB? In my opinion, A level. Uh, and the reason I say I'm not disparaging the IB, it, it's, a, it's a very good qualification. I think A-level, and I always have done, and there's one simple answer, depth. Now, as you know, IB, you've got higher level and standard level, and the higher levels, self-evidently, are, are higher than the standards. A-level biology, A-level chemistry, A-level maths, or if you study physics instead of, or in addition to the maths, the, the depth within a level, in my experience, is a much better preparation for the first year of med school. And <clears throat> in the past, I was heavily involved with, with sending dozens of students up, up, up to medical school and would stay in touch with them. You know, that's when I was working in London. And the students, would they'd come back and talk to our new medics, so to speak. Um, and they would say, you know, they made good friends on, on the medical course who'd studied the IB, um, who were struggling with some elements um, because they hadn't had the depth of study of biology, chemistry, and maths in particular, actually, um, that the A level students have had. So, greatest of respect to IB, but an unequivocal, if you're aiming for medicine, A levels. Thank you. Um, this is a really interesting one. What's the main disadvantage of A-level? I think the main disadvantage is if you, and there are two really, so it's choosing one. I'm going to characterise it as a potential disadvantage <coughs> and hopefully you'll, you'll see one. Fundamentally, to get into a good university in the UK, so we're talking not just the Russell Group Universities, broader than the Russell Group Universities, you know, you're really needing to look at three Bs, minimum, absolute minimum. A potential disadvantage for A-level, if a student is not guided correctly and they end up on A-level, is that they simply cannot get those three Bs. So that's not so much a disadvantage of A-levels, that's what can occur if a student isn't given the kind of guidance um, akin to what we've spoken about today. I think the second one is, is relative disadvantage. And once again, it relates to one of the characteristics I mentioned earlier on, in exams. If, if a student is exam phobic, if a student simply does not perform well in exams, and there's no evidence that he or she ever has, then because of that reason, the A-levels are disadvantageous and a student should steer away from A-level. Great. Um, do you have any feedback from universities as to whether they prefer an A-level A -level or IB student? Um, IB schools sometimes refer to universities acknowledging better university preparation in their students. Yeah, and I think I can understand why the IB schools would do that, and I've read a lot of the material where they have said that. Um, I'm, I'm going to be extremely fair 
and say that the universities are as they are. They're absolutely fine with, with IB or A level. Um, some of the, the more contentious material that came out, and I'm, I'm trying not to be confrontational with IB providers, because as I've said, it's a great qualification. Um, there was an equation made whereby particular schools uh, at IB, sixes and sevens and the total overall score, were worth more than the A-levels. Well, they, they're not, is the honest answer. Um, and the universities don't make um, lower offers to IB students. They make offers based on what they know about the IB and thereby the standards they require. Uh, and the same for A-levels. So there is, there is no preference of IB over A-level or indeed A-level over IB. Both are perfectly acceptable. Um, and I should say, as is BTEC, um, there are some universities for some courses um, that will not accept the BTEC. And that's a very simple question of advising the student correctly before they choose the BTEC. Um, but the vast majority, including the Russell Group universities, with the exception of Oxford and Cambridge, um, and one or two others, will, will accept the BTEC. So we've had many BTEC students going on to Bristol, Manchester, um, Queen Mary, for example. Okay, I think that's all the questions that we've had. Super. Thank I'm you. Going back right, that's smashing. Everybody, thank you so much yet again for, for all of your time uh, and your questions. And I'm glad that uh, it didn't evolve into me just talking for an hour. Um, as those of you who know me very well, know me very well I, I do like to talk. So I'm very glad I didn't do soul lecture for an hour and have the opportunity to answer some some questions it was very very interesting very good and, and i hope you all found the, the presentation uh, useful um, as i said i think if we match those characteristics of students to programs then we will ensure the student success which is clearly great for us um, great for parents and most importantly above all else great for the students Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Um, and the next session is going to be uh, Yasmin Sawa from Oxford International College talking about the post-COVID educational landscape. Really interesting topic, so head over to that now.